Okay, last check. Can you uh, can people on Zoom see what I see? Good, perfect. Finally, so this is uh, what twelve minutes later. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we have an, uh, a pretty fun topic today. So um, uh, I promise you I'm going to cover through the pass um, uh, repairs, but I realized I didn't get there. So uh, this uh, will postpone this for, uh, for Thursday. Uh, instead, we will talk about semantic query optimization. So this is a plan. Uh, today we will discuss uh, generalized constraints and uh, uh, semantic query optimization, which are kind of related to this topic. And third they uh, go to repairs and hopefully to incomplete databases and we'll see how far we get from there. Okay, so um, constraints. What is a constraint? It's a logical assertion that must be true on the database. Now, if you are new to databases, this is nothing new. You have seen this. Uh, an invariant in a program is a logical assertion that must be true at that point in the program. And my question to you is, are these two the same thing? Or is a fundamental difference between uh, invariance in programs and uh, database constraints? Come on, it's a simple difference. Yes? I think you could probably have, you could make a constraint in the program the same way you can constrain in the database. So if you're in the database, it's just saying I will reject anything that won't satisfy the program. Exactly. So, so how do you reject this? You need to check it. Right? Do you ever check the constraint in the in the program? There, there was already an invariant in the program. Well, when you did debug it, but once it's in production, it's over. Yeah. So this is the main major difference. Constraints need to be checked and enforced at runtime. Invariance in programs are something you run statically, I said there, but it's actually you do this on paper. You check that your program is correct. Uh, maybe you check it, uh, debug it, and check the invariance. But once it works and it's correct, then you, you, you forget about them, and they have to always hold by the design of the program. Are That's they defined it. under certain operations? Sorry? Are they defined under certain operations? The invariance? Like, these hold, if I only do, like, X, Y, and Z to, like, to the database or oh the the invariants they uh, must hold on the global database at any moment uh, sometimes it's easy to check that a small update will uh, violate or will not violate the constraint sometimes it's much harder yeah so let's let's see constraints and then we'll talk about them in in, in more detail um, uh, so application there are many applications of constraints the old ones uh, the, the the classical ones is to enforce database consistency we want the dat database um, to be clean. And we talk here about these um, very elegant constraints and uh, entropic vectors. But in reality, what um, developers care, and this is what you find on the web, is that you put a dash in your phone number, right? You spend half an hour filling out a difficult web page. When you click the I pay button, they say you have an error. Where the error before goes, a dash is in the phone number. That That is a database constraint, super important. Uh, I'm not kidding. It's really super important to, for the data to be clean, but it uh, tells you a little bit where we are in the theory world. Uh, the second application, which we are not discussing, is database normalization. Uh, you use uh, the functional dependencies in particular, or the multivariate dependencies, to redesign your data. And that's uh, a topic that you should be aware of. We are not going to discover it. The things that uh, are interesting for us uh, are semantic optimization and the other two. Semantic optimization goes like this. Given a query that we want to execute, and before we execute, we want to optimize it, uh, find a better and optimized query Q prime that is not necessarily always equivalent to Q, but that is equivalent to Q over the databases that satisfy the constraint. So we want to use a constraint to improve the query optimizer. That I find this very cool. And it's something that uh, you don't see in programming languages or, or in compilers. 
Um, the second application, which is kind of modern, is database repairs. Now we get data from the web. We expect this to satisfy constraints, but the constraints are violated, like the key constraint is violated. So we need to fix fix that. You need to remove um, the wrong topics. Yes. What do you mean by we don't see this kind of stuff in science and career analysis? Um, uh, so uh, the, the, this uh, setup in which I uh, assert that something holds on my data, uh, please go and optimize better based on my assertion on the data. I don't see, I don't know of anything equivalent in comparison. I may be wrong. Uh, yes, please. There are like claim, like in C++, right? There are a lot of places where claim will assume that undefined behavior will happen and it will remove code paths. Also like another example is if you have a signed integer and you multiply by two, if the signed integer is strictly greater than zero, then claim will turn that into a bit shift or sorry, divide by two, claim will turn that into a bit shift. But if it could be negative, the bit shift is not the same. So depending on whether you add an insertion, it will actually generate better code. So. Very nice. So I'm I'm not exactly uh, right here about uh, my, my I didn't put it down in writing, uh, but I still claim that the kind of optimization that I'm, I'm going to show you that actually much more powerful than you than the ones you described. Uh, so the second one is database repair. We get a data which is not as doesn't quite satisfy the constraint. We want to fix it. Um, again, it's a novel application. Didn't exist in the 70s, 80s, but it's it's important today. Um, and then there is a pretty theoretical aspect, uh, consistent query answering. I shouldn't go too deep into this. If we have time, then we, we will discuss, uh, discuss it as well. Good, so uh, my plan for today is to quickly review the classical database constraints and then define uh, generalized dependencies which capture all of them and then discuss semantic optimization. Here is what we saw last time, uh, functional dependencies and multivariate dependencies. There are two additional classical constraints, join dependencies and inclusion dependencies. And I will briefly show them how they look like. Bless you. Functional dependencies. Uh, this is a notation. A set of attributes functionally determines another attribute. Uh, the functional dependency holds in a relation R, in an instance R, uh, if for um, any two tuples in the relation that uh, have the same value of U, they also have the same value of D. Notice that in order to write this in, in our um, um, first of the logic notation, I also had to refer to W the other attributes that are not U or D. Yeah, it's a very simple um, assertion that this function depends. Uh, is, this, is this logical statement clear? It's going to become very important, so it, it must be very obvious. Uh, okay. As a consequence, if the functional dependency holds, then we have a lossless decomposition. This is what every undergraduate student that takes introduction to databases should know. If the functional de dependency holds, then you, decomp you can decompose R into uh, R1 using attributes U and V, and R2 using U and the other attributes, the rest of the attributes. And what we saw last time is that uh, function the implication problem is axiomatizable, and uh, it is uh, the implication is decidable even in polynomial time. Okay, functional dependencies. Multivariate dependencies. So, uh, are you okay? Should I go? Uh, multivariate dependencies. So here we, uh, it's convenient to expose um, uh, all set, three disjoint set of attributes that cover all the attributes X. So we have a partition into U, V, W. Multivariate dependency is denoted like this. U multivariate determines V uh, semicolon W. Uh, traditional textbooks, they often omit W, but that's very ugly. So um, it's much more natural to include both because the, ro the role of V and W is symmetric. When does a multivariate dependency hold? It's a mouthful, but it's actually quite natural. Uh, when uh, essentially when conditioned on U, we have a Cartesian product. The relation is a Cartesian product of V and W. Logic and logic, this is written like as follows. Whenever we have two tuples in the relation R that agree on U, then you, you have all the other two combinations of these tuples. It suffices to include just one because the other one follows by symmetry. So uh, we also have the combination V1 with W2 with the same U. 
It is almost like a rectangularity to screen films. Uh, absolutely, it's Cartesian product. If you think about Cartesian product, means like a rectangle. If you have uh, A with B and C with D, you also have A with B and B with C. What is it? Sorry, if you go back to the previous slide, what is the difference between the definite? Like, so here we have UV going UW, and then the next one is UV joined on is UW. It, is it the same? Yep. Okay, cool. What's it, what's the difference, by the way? And this is a one function dependencies and multivariate. What's the difference? This is a definition. The multivariate dependency holds if and only if, I mean, by definition, if this decomposition holds. Uh, the, for function dependencies, this is a consequence. Mm -hmm. This tells us uh, something immediate. Uh, one implies the other, which implies which. This one implies the next one. This one implies the next one. If the function dependency holds, then this is a consequence. And by definition, then the market value dependency holds. OK, but of course, the converse is not true. You can have a Cartesian product, and there is no function dependency here. Yeah. Uh, okay, what about the implication problem? Well, that had an axiomatic system as well, not just a set of MPDs, but together, the functional dependencies plus the multivariate dependencies. Uh, so it's axiomatizable, it looked pretty ugly. We saw a variant uh, that um, of, of implication that uses entropic vectors. Um, uh, the bottom line, it, it is axiomatizable and decidable. Okay, any questions about these two? Good. The next one I'm going to show you is called a joint dependency. Uh, a joint dependency uh, starts with not a partition, but a cover of all the attributes. So we have a set, a set of sets of attributes whose union uh, are all the attributes of the relation. And the joint dependency is written syntactically like this. You can guess what it means. It means that the relation uh, is equal to the join of these projections. But I'm also interested in writing this in logic. OK, so here is an example, uh, kind of the simplest joint dependency, which is not the multivariate uh, function dependency. We want to say that the relation R, X, Y, Z uh, is actually a, a set of triangles. So it is a join of its projection on X, Y, Y, Z, and X, Z. How do we write this in logic? Uh, and if you think about this, we want to say that whenever there is uh, an x, y, and a y, z, and an x, z, and the relation, then we have x, y, z, and the relation. But how do we say that x, y is in the relation? Well, what we need to say is that there is another z prime, uh, such that, uh, that that z prime can have any value. But the top of x, y, and z prime is in the relation R. And similarly, uh, uh, yz are in the relation R and xz in the relation R. And if all this happens, then xyz is in the relation R. Yeah, it's just uh, just logic. Equivalently, uh, and this probably you like this much more, uh, the uh, joint dependency holds if um, uh, R uh, is is equal to the to the join of the projections on the attribute U. Is it obvious to everyone that uh, multivariate dependencies are just a special case of joint dependencies? No, it's not clear. Okay, I need to write this down here. So a multivariate dependency looks like this. X multivariate determines, uh, uh, actually should write UV, not X. Uh, U multivariate determines P semicolon W, which means that the relation R on U. Just a second. So uh, the relation R uh, on uh, U and uh, P and W 
is equal to the projection on UV join the projection on uh, UW. This is a joint dependency. What are the, the, the sets U1, U2 that I used here? You read them from, from here. So one set is UV, and the second one is UW. So the multivariate dependency is equivalent to the joint dependency UV and UW. Is, is joint dependency on two sets the same as a multivariable set? Uh, yes. Sets? They, they have to cover everything, and then you just call U their intersection, and then you get a multivariate dependency. There is a deeper connection uh, between acyclic joint dependencies and a set of multivariate dependencies, uh, but I am not prepared to state it. Okay, any questions about joint dependencies? Okay, here is what the textbook says. And I, I, some of the material I prepared based on the um, um, textbook by Peter Bull Holandiano. The implication problem for uh, just uh, joint dependencies is not axiomatizable. They stated without proof. I, I'll take it um, at, at face value. So apparently it's not axiomatizable. But however, uh, it is it is apparently it's, it's decidable. So uh, actually it's not apparently we should be able to even prove this uh, uh, later. So the implication problem for functional dependencies and joint dependencies is decidable. Uh, to be honest, I have some philosophical doubts about the first question. Um, I don't know if, if, you, if somebody wants to comment before I uh, share my thoughts. How can you say it's not axiomatizable if it is decidable? Yes? Uh, so is this saying that it's not finitely axiomatizable? Maybe not finitely, and last night I missed the word finitely. Uh, then it makes sense. But if, it, if, if you don't put the word finitely, Usually, um, what, what you expect is a enumerable set of, of axioms. Once implication problem is decidable, you immediately have an enumerable set of axioms. You just enumerate all the consequences. And that is already an, an axiomatization. It's a trivial one, but it's an axiomatization. So maybe me, the word finite is missing here. Yes? So what's the difference between the implementation of FD plus JD? Uh, with just implication of JD itself, because JD is a generalization of JD. Uh, yes. So um, uh, uh, the implication problem for just GDs is also uh, decidable as a consequence of, of the second statement. Okay. But the second statement says that even if you add function dependencies to, to your logic, to your set of constraints, then the implication problem is still decidable. Uh, but isn't that kind of easy? If you can decide JD, you can you just which JDs are not FDs, right? No. Uh, when we say the implication problem for FDs plus JDs, it means that our set of constraints contain both uh, joint dependencies and functional dependencies. So now some consequences uh, can be enabled by the presence of the functional dependencies. We need to reason about those. Okay, maybe this will become a little bit clearer when we get to the chase. Uh, and I'm not kidding, so that's the name, that's the technical name, the chase. Um, okay, and the last one is called inclusion dependencies. They're actually kind of important. Um, so we have two, re two, two relations this time. It's the first time we have a constraint between two relations. <clears throat> and uh, we have two subsets of their attributes of the same uh, length with the same number of attributes. And an inclusion dependency says that the, the projection on R on the set U is a subset of the projection of, this should be S, uh, on the set D. The, the, the second one should be S. Okay. Uh, in notation, very easy to write this in, in first order logic. We say for every tuple in R, there exists a tuple in S. Notice, uh, very important, we use, need to use this existential quantifier uh, to fill in the, the missing attributes, the ones that are not in, in V. Uh, yeah, the one, because uh, um, 
uh, B are only a subset of this should be S. Yes. Uh, should the uh, cardinality of U be equal to the cardinality of B instead of Y, or is that supposed to be Y? Uh, that's supposed to be B. This is supposed to be B. This is supposed to be S. Thank you. I will fix it. I have all the type was from last week. I've, I've, I'm already fixed. Okay, an inclusion dependency. Here, the yes. No, I'm just trying to, like, where, where is the B? Ah, uh, this should be B. Okay. But it's, it's actually much easier to read the logical statement, and we will move in this direction. Here is what the textbook says. Uh, in inclusion dependencies in isolation are axiomatizable. This gets back to Remy's question. If we only uh, want to consider inclusion dependencies, then we can axiomatize this and uh, the implication problem is decidable. And the book says it's decidable in polynomial space. It's also P space complete. Okay, I have no, no good intuition why this is decidable or decidable in polynomial space. But the interesting uh, um, uh, addition is that if you also include functional dependencies, then the implication problem becomes undecidable. Very unexpected, at least um, to me. So, um, but in, in some sense, it's not. It's actually it's not that unexpected. If you have a more powerful language, then uh, the, the implication might be harder. Yes, Sudipa. The inclusion dependencies. They are anti-monotone, uh, or monotone, whereas uh, functional dependencies are anti-monotone. Like if you remove two proofs, then they are satisfied. Whereas if you add two proofs, then inclusion dependencies are satisfied. Very, very, they are constant in both directions. Very nice observation. So, um, uh, functional dependencies, say, um, yeah, if, if it holds on the relation, it also holds on any subset. While inclusion dependencies, it will not have this nice property. Yes. Inclusion so dependencies on the other layer. Right? That would be well, uh, not necessary. Sorry, uh, but, yeah, you 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 can. Uh, Depends on which one you are inserting. You can remove from R and you can insert an S. Yes, Grace. Is this basically just saying that if I take R, uh -huh. like big R, and I project onto U, and I take S and I project onto U, those two are the same? Uh, yes, except that you on you know, R you project on on V. Why V? Because it might have different names. Okay, wait, wait. So it's because of the, bot, the bottom logical statement doesn't have any things at all. Uh, yeah, uh, the issue is that in the logical statement, we, we use variables uh, whose names are unrelated oh, to so the name. Little u could be, so little u could be like, is from big u and one and big v in the other? Or this little, this little u is from uh, this big u, uh, but when, when I place it here, it's from v. And then it's from v. And it's like an abstract variable uh, u1, u2, which stands for, I don't know, name and zip code. And the name and zip code are the true names of attributes. We, we have this little friction all the time uh, between the variable names and the attribute names. Good. So that was the last um, uh, uh, kind of dependency. So at this point, you must be wondering, like I did. Uh, we have functional dependencies, multivariate dependencies, joint dependencies, inclusion dependencies. So how many more can we invent and when do we stop? And it turns out that all of them can be captured by a single very elegant formalism, which are called generalized dependencies. And that's uh, what I want to go today, generalized dependencies. Um, so here is a definition. Uh, a generalized dependency might refer to uh, multiple relation names. We have a relational schema. And a generalized dependency has one of the following two forms. There will be two forms, but I will argue that they are actually um, instances of the same form. The first one is called the tuple generating dependency, or TGD. And it looks like this. For all x, where x is a set of variables, uh, and here we have a conjunction of relational atoms. Uh, we say that ex we, 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 we implies so for, uh, for every x, if this holds, then th there exists uh, y such that a conjunction of possible other atoms holds. I should uh, emphasize here, I should have put a parenthesis. These variables x apply to the entire expression. 
I really should be should have put big parentheses from uh, for all x all the way to the end. Okay, these are called tuple generating dependencies, um, and uh, the the TGD is called full if there is no existential quantifier. Okay, the second kind is called inequality generating dependency or EGD, which has the same the same kind of um, of um, um, predicate on the left, a conjunction of atoms. But the conclusion now is it's just a simple equality between two of the of the x variables. It's called an uh, equality generating dependency. Let's see examples. Uh, yes. So, like the TGG is X applies, but it has any implication for equality generating X is applied to everything, and then the equality also to everything. And equality is, is easier to see because, because uh, these Xi are actually specific variables from the set X. Yeah, but I should have put parentheses. I, I would, yeah, and I actually remove them. I try to be frugal, so big mistake. The parentheses should be there. Let's see examples. A functional dependency is what kind of uh, generalized constraint the dependency? I wrote here a functional dependency. Uh, it's essentially a key constraint. It says that u is a key in R. But obviously, it's an EGD, right? Then it What about an, an, um, a, a multivariate dependency? How would you call this now in a professional way? What kind of dependency is this? TGD. It's a TGD. What kind of TGD? It's a full TGD, no existential quantifier. And what about an inclusion dependency? What kind of dependency is this? This is a TGD with an existential quantifier. Yeah. You can imagine much richer such dependencies. Uh, you can have conjunctions on the left as many as you want. You can have as many conjunctions on the right as you want. You can imagine very powerful constraints. Let's dissect a little bit these generalized dependencies to understand um, you know, what you can do with them and where, where they come from. Uh, why, do, why do I allow a, an existential quantifier on the right? but uh, not on the left. And here I wrote it correctly. You see, uh, for all x applies to the whole thing. And it turns out you do not need an existential quantifier on the left. Uh, sometimes it's actually convenient to write it there, but uh, uh, strictly we do not need this. Here is an example. Uh, this is an inclusion dependency. It says that for every x, if X occurs on the first position of R, and I say this by saying there exists some Y such that R of X and Y, then X occurs also on the first position of S. Uh, and I say this by, uh, by saying there exists Z such that S of X and Z. How do we remove the existential quantifier from the left? Sorry? Uh, so uh, I, I, do, do I remove it? I... Do you just project out like Y? Like make a new relation like R prime. Ah, I, and denote it with, with R prime. But it's, it's, it's an overkill. So I just you want just a sing, single formula. Yes. Just remove it, right? It's just, more as low as you just drop it. Just, just drop what? Drop, I, I, if, I, if, I remo if I drop this existential Y, then Y here is not bound. You can just look Y universally over Y as well. Yeah. Well, if I, exactly. You want, you, you uh, I, in the morning. You said it. Okay. So uh, you, you take out the existential and becomes a universal. And here is indeed where the Morgan law, law applies because remember an implication actually negates the left hand side. Yeah. So this is why the existential from the left becomes a universal. This is why we don't need uh, existentials on the left. But if you want to put them there, which are not needed on the right, then you can put them as existential on the left. Okay, uh, second observation, um, if, if we don't have existentials uh, and we have multiple atoms on the right, maybe relational atoms, equality, we can uh, break them into two uh, separate uh, generalized dependencies. Now you can simplify a little bit. This explains why the EGDs um, stand alone. We are, are treated separately. 
We don't have to, but we can always take out those equalities and treat them separately. Okay. Uh, so I'm repeated for the zoom. So depend, uh, dependencies that have inequalities or disequalities, can they be modeled here? They're not part of the pure uh, um, generalized dependency uh, definition. Uh, you can always add them. This is a beauty in theory. You can define whatever you want. The question is, uh, uh, the results you're relying upon, uh, what kind of termination results or you know, decidability results, we need to re-examine if they uh, still hold. So I will stick to the uh, traditional definition, which is without um, uh, disequalities and without uh, less than or equal. And, uh, disjunction, uh, uh, same with disjunction. They are not, not uh, allowed, and sometimes they're useful. Yep. Um, okay, and the third, the third observation that I wanted to make, and this is kind of related to what Grace wanted to say, you should think of any generalized dependency as asserting that two conjunctive queries are contained in, uh, in uh, one in another. If I want to say that this implication holds, and here uh, for this purpose, it's actually beneficial to push inside the 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 universal variables that I don't need on the right, I push them inside, becomes, they become existential variables. So this Im implication is equivalent to saying that uh, one conjunctive query is contained in another conjunctive query. The first conjunctive query is a left-hand side. It's just a projection on R. The second conjunctive query is a right-hand side, projection on S. And what the, this generalized constraint says is that the answer to Q1 is a subset of the answer to Q2. This also tells us that it's, it's easy to check. Uh, if a database instance satisfies the generalized constraints, just evaluate these two conjunctive queries. I mean, you need to optimize it, evaluate them, but it's, it's, it's computable in polynomial time. It's decidable in polynomial time. This is not the implication problem. This is a model checking problem. We just want to check if a database satisfies these constraints. Yes, Remy. Yeah, so the parallelization for this y might be what might be up. This one? So this y is over the whole implication, right? So it should be all over R or uh, this exists. Why should it be only over R? And you're right, my parentheses here are not uh, are actually wrong. And this this is, should have a parenthesis there. This parenthesis should close here. Yeah, so obviously I didn't didn't see the parenthesis well. That is a mistake. Okay, good. So um, how should we think about, uh, about uh, generalized uh, dependencies? They are a fragment of fertile logic. In fertile logic, we can write all sorts of sentences. The generalized dependencies, they seem to be a sweet spot between being uh, uh, general enough to capture all the classical dependencies and perhaps even more, and yet limited enough that we can do something useful with them that they are not, uh, uh, they, are, they don't immediately face Trachtenbrot theorem that says nothing is decidable. Uh, and what I want to show you is the one of what I find that one of the coolest applications of uh, generalized dependencies, which is semantic query optimization. Okay, so let's talk about semantic query optimization. Um, so it, what it means. It means that uh, we have a set of database constraints, and these will be generalized dependencies. And uh, semantic query optimization means that we, we are going to optimize the query uh, in a way in which we exploit the, uh, uh, these constraints. The new optimized query will only work correctly on a database that satisfies these constraints. But by exploiting these constraints, the hope is that it's going to be much more efficient. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so this, uh, I, this just, I, I just said this. So we are going to replace Q with another query Q prime, but it's equivalent to Q on every database that satisfies the constraints. Uh, this is a notation that we're going to use. Q and Q prime might in general not be equivalent, but they will be equivalent under sigma, under the, uh, the constraints sigma. 
the generalized dependency sigma. And that is a standard notation that we used from lecture one to um, determine, to define um, uh, entailment implication. And I should also mention the semantics optimization is an old idea. Actually, not sure exactly what to, uh, to who's credited for this. I found this reference to the PhD thesis uh, from Stanford by King. And then there is this uh, survey paper by Chakrabarty um, and all. So it's, it's a really an old idea. So maybe Joan knows. Um, okay, so let's see uh, an example. Here are two queries. Uh, the second one is simple. It looks for uh, all the Z's uh, that uh, are with 50. So look, yeah, find 55 in S and return the corresponding Z. Could be multiple Z's. The second one is more contrived. Um, look for uh, X with 55 in R, then the same X with Y and return the Z and S associated to that Y. No constraints yet. Question to you, is Q1 is, uh, mm -hmm. contained in Q2? Is this a case that every answer to Q1 is also an answer to Q2? And then vice versa. In case you wonder, let me remind you that you are experts in query containment. You have sold uh, a homework, a beautiful homework. You know how to reason about this, but you need to check to check containment of Q1 and Q2. You need to find what? a homomorphism from Q2 to Q1. Or even simpler, uh, there is only one database on which you need to check Q2. Which database? The canonical database that consists of the three tuples in Q1. So this is a little test. Look at uh, these three tuples in Q1. I didn't draw the, the tables, but you have a table with two R tuples and one S tuple. Uh, will that return on, the, on that database? Will it return S? Will it return this, the Z? Z is now a constant. Will it return Z? No, it will not return Z because in S you find YZ, you don't find 55Z. Yeah, now what, Y is really a constant, it's like constant seven. So you, you, you find seven with Z, you do not find 55 and Z. So the answer is no. What about Q2 included in Q1? Every time we have uh, uh, 55 and Z, do, do we also have this in the database? Obviously not, yeah. What is a canonical database for Q2? 55Z. Just 55Z, and what about R? It's empty. Once R is empty, Q, Q1 returns nothing, okay? Good. So now my question to you is the following. Imagine a constraint. Uh, think about a classical one, don't uh, try to come up with something that's very smart, that ensures that Q1 is a, uh, is a subset of Q2. Uh, yes? A functional dependency from X to Y. A functional dependency from X to Y. Or equivalently, X is a key. Yeah? So X is a key. And I wrote it like this. So for any two tuples, xw and xy in, in R, w must be equal to y. If this is guaranteed to hold on the database, then the query q1 uh, has the following property. This y must be equal to 55. So the query is equal to, and what I wrote here is a query where y, now y has been replaced with 55. Uh, and since the atom x55 occurs twice, I removed one copy and the query is equivalent to this one. And now this new query is uh, contained in Q2 unrestricted. We don't even have to care about the, uh, the key dependency. Now there is a trivial homomorphism from Q2 into here. And now the symmetrical question, when is Q2 contained in Q1? Who wants to volunteer? Uh, well, if I if I have such a tuple, then obviously R cannot be empty, right? There must be stuff in R. Uh, uh, so it suffices if 
uh, my y is in R. That's what I need. If my y is in R, then uh, these uh, these two these two atoms can be mapped to that to that y, and I'm done. Yeah. So it's just an inclusion uh, an inclusion dependency. So let's let's see how this applies. If this inclusion dependency holds for every tuple y, t, and s, uh, we also have some x with y in R. If this holds, then we can modify Q2. Uh, so to modify Q2, I wanted to be a little bit more pedantic. Uh, it's not clear how to, what to do with this 55 in the presence of, uh, uh, of y here. Uh, so I, I rewrote a Q2 uh, as S of x and y, z, uh, and y is equal to 55. This is the same as Q2. So now, because this containment holds, uh, in addition to the tuple x, s of x, uh, y, z, we also have r of x, y. Yeah, so I could add this because of this implication. Uh, and now we are back to, uh, um, I mean, now we remember that y is equal to 55. I substituted y with 55, and we get that q2 is equivalent to this query here. This is not quite Q1, but it, su it suffices for our purpose. Q2 is contained in Q1. What is a homomorphism from Q1 into he here? Uh, obviously, we map the variable x to where? X. To x, and we map this variable y to what? To 55, and that's it. OK. Um, uh, yeah, so that is the bottom line. If uh, we assume that these two constraints, sigma 1 and sigma 2, hold, then, we, then these two queries become equivalent. And then the optimizer should, in principle, um, be able to rewrite Q1 into Q2. Yes? Uh, so you're talking about uh, how we can get checkers and then we can get token canonical databases. Is there a concept of canonical databases in your uh, generalized open case? Like, are we a very good question. Let me repeat this. For query containment, it suffices to look at one database, namely the canonical database. Is there something similar for uh, the dependencies? And the answer is yes. We need to first chase the query, um, uh, kind of enforce all these dependencies, and then we get the chased version of the, chased version of the query that serves the role of the canonical database. That's where we go, where we are going. Yes. Uh, does it take work to show that the constraints are sort of like the weakest possible constraints that you could put on to get this implication? Because like I don't know that this is the weakest possible constraint. Yeah. So uh, it's a good question. So uh, if we really, if all we care is to to make sure that these two queries are equivalent, are these the weakest constraints you can add to make these two queries equivalent? Uh, it's funny because actually I wanted to start a research project on this topic. Uh, and we stopped when I realized that there is a trivial answer to this question. What is the simplest constraint uh, under which these two queries are equivalent? Right. So they're equivalent. This is, yeah, if you have two complicated queries and you want your database to uh, ensure that they are equivalent, you just assert these are equivalent. Nothing to research. Um, uh, so that was the end. Uh, uh, it's, How can it be yeah. weaker than this? Right. And anything else must imply this. So is the question the like a constraint of the form, like a GD form that's the weakest or something? Like yeah, so, th so that will be the next question. Can you limit the kind of constraints and still look for this? But we didn't pursue this. This was with Shumo, by the way. Uh, OK, so uh, talking about the chase, now it's, it's a good time to talk about the chase. Uh, so we want to construct that canonical database, and the process to do there is to repeatedly add to Q um, the consequences of generalized dependencies in our set of constraints. This process is called a chase, and intuitively it consists of applying to the query Q uh, the consequence of, of this generalized dependency, and this creates a new query that I'm going to call Q1 which adds stuff to, to Q. Now, the important semantic property 
uh, that this query holds that the, our syntactic construction we need to enforce is that um, uh, under the assumption of the constraints uh, sigma, these two queries are equivalent. That is going to be the important semantic uh, consequence. Now, once we get Q1, we can repeat the process and chase again and again and again. And uh, then in order to check query equivalence, what we need to do is we need to chase both, both queries. And uh, if we are lucky and the chase terminates, then we get that canonical database that we needed. And we just check that they are the same. Uh, and if they are not, not lucky, if we are not lucky, then at least uh, if we can find two chased queries that are uh, equivalent, then they are equivalent. Don't worry, this is a preview of what's coming on the next slide. Yes? Why why chase over the query instead of like chasing over the canonical databases? Ah, uh, but this is the same, chasing of the, over the query or chasing over the canonical database is the same thing. Uh, but you, your question is actually points to a deeper, to deeper point. Most of the literature talks about chasing a database, not chasing a query. Uh, it's not exclusive. So uh, chasing a query for the purpose of query uh, equivalence is, is in the book. Uh, but um, um, modern, I mean, recent papers on chase, they chase a database, not a query. Uh, but it's kind of the same thing, the database, a query. Yeah. Uh, Joe doesn't like. No. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, so let's here is the technical definition of the chase. Uh, so we have two kind of e of uh, generalized dependencies, and I didn't know how to write them. I wrote, wrote I wrote both of them like this. So there exists X. These are the conjunction of the atoms on the left, and here on the right we can either have an equality or a um, tuple generating uh, predicate. Um, okay, so the chase is the following: uh, find a homomorphism from the left-hand side to the query. And then the, the chase, the one-step chase using this dependency and that homomorphism is a new query Q prime defined as follows. If the consequence C uh, was uh, defined at TGD, so we have this exist uh, Y and D, then we simply add to Q the uh, image uh, of D under this homomorphism. Notice that uh, B has a new variable Y. That variable will still occur here. We need to make sure it doesn't clash with any variable of, of Q. So we might need to rename it. Okay. If it is an EGD, uh, then simply uh, replace, uh, I think this should be, uh, yeah, this should be theta. Uh, um, I, I, I need to ap apply theta here. So then simply substitute one of the variables with the other. That, that's what it says. Let's see some examples. Here is a query. So um, uh, Rxy and A of Y, then Rxz and B of Z. And uh, I have two constraints. The first one is a, an EGD, uh, says that U is a key in R. You can imagine what, what happens to this query. And the second one is an inclusion dependency, says that um, everything in the first position of R also occurs in S. How do we chase Q with uh, the first, the first uh, constraint of this um, uh, EGD? And I also need to give it a homomorphism. The homomorphism maps the variables UVW to X, Y, Z here, to X, Y, Z. So the question is, I mean, first we need to check this is homomorphism. And I highlighted here the, the, the part that we need to check is mapped into Q. Where is it mapped? To which atoms of Q uh, are these two mapped? Pretty straightforward, right? right to, to, to this R and to that R. And then what do we need to do to Q to chase? using this. We need to equate uh, the variables y and z. Yeah, so substitute one of them with, uh, we substitute z with y. That's all there is. Uh, the, the left hand side, the stuff in blue is like a pattern map. 
and then the right hand side is what I'm replacing with. And then there's also implicitly I'm allowed to merge two atoms if there's two atoms within. Yeah, if, are, if if two atoms are identical, you always want to remove one uh, as a duplicate. Uh, it's pattern matching. It, it is like pattern matching, but usually single bit is a, is a homomorphism. So uh, this does not necessarily have to be injective. Okay, uh, and the second one is still injective. Sorry about this. Um, so uh, now I want to chase with sigma two, and I'm going to define, uh, now I already highlighted this. So my homomorphism goes from uh, UV to 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 this up to what am I doing? That's why I forgot. Should be I should have I, I wanted to highlight this because I wanted to change this result. So it should uh, I'm going to map it here, and then the result is I need to add s. This is what I need to do. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah. I see. So this should have been this should have disappeared. The blue. Animation is um, not that easy. Um, yeah, so so if I chase the result with the inclusion dependency, then I simply add S here, if that's what I needed. That, that's a fresh W, right? And that is a fresh W, very good. This has to be a fresh W. If this was called, uh, I don't know why, then we need to rename it. Yeah, this is a chase. Should be it, it's so simple that uh, this slide almost doesn't do it justice, but I didn't know how to simplify it beyond this. Can you guarantee that this process terminates? Good question. Does this process terminate? Uh, okay, so let's discuss this. Uh, of, of course, given a set of, of uh, generalized dependencies, we can chase and chase and chase. Yeah. yeah. And uh, in general, this does not need to terminate. And the simplest example that I'm aware of where it not, doesn't terminate goes like this. Uh, imagine R is a graph. It says for every edge from X to Y, there exists a continuation from Y to some new node Z. So now if we start with a database or with a very simple query that only has two variables, U0 and U1, then if we chase it one, we, in, we create a new atom with a fresh variable, the z, I called it u2. And now we chase again, and the, we, we use a homomorphism from x, y to this fresh atom, and this creates a, yet a new atom, and so on. We can chase forever and ever. You see, who's the cold culprit here? Why did, uh, if we chase on functional dependencies, it always terminates. What is the syntactic property that created this issue? Yes? I don't know what syntactic property is the issue is that there's, we have a cycle of derivatives, right? Uh, and is, uh, you know, we have a cycle in the database. Uh, in, in the sense that, like, if R is an edge relation, then there's, it's possible that we, there's a cyclic sort of edge. Yeah. Got it. Uh, I, I was aiming for something much simpler. Uh, it's, it's the existential quantifier. If we didn't have an existential quantifier, then we never create these fresh variables. And then the, the number of atoms we can never create is, is limited. It's it's finite. It's based on it consists of only the existing variables in the query. Uh, but people did look at, at this question. So if we have existential variables, can we still uh, kind of have some syntactic property that ensures termination? And that syntactic property is called weak acyclicity. Uh, and uh, I, I'm uh, but in general, checking termination is undecidable. And I don't know if there is a stronger, I think there is a stronger property. So Remy and Max may actually know more um, about the chase. Did, did you want to add something? Oh, I was going to mention that this cyclicity is tied to the U book. I'm going to just not take What's that? Just not take one. So they just, they just take one. Uh, so I zero, mean, one. Yeah, so the, the notion of cyclicity is around somewhere, right? Like you need, yeah. to, you need to be creating existentials in oh, a relation that can create existentials. Otherwise, yeah. you won't be terrible. Yeah, I don't remember off the top of my head the no, definition of weak acyclicity. It's a little bit confused, but it's kind of the strongest we know that um, guarantees termination and yet allows you to have existential uh, existential quantifiers and allows you to have the same relation R in the head and uh, 
in the um, on the left and the right. It's not sequence, isn't it? Just infinite sizes. Yeah, because it's weaker. You don't want the test like the you keep getting more you just get yeah. Okay. Um, the other uh, unexpected thing uh, is that uh, the chase may fail uh, only in the presence of constants. So if you um, uh, are trying to identify two, two, two variables, but they are two constants and they are distinct, then you cannot do this. Here is an example. We assert that X is a key, uh, but the query looks for two tuples where that obviously violates the key condition. Isn't this not, why, why, why do you call this fail? Um, well, if you try to apply the chase, you will attempt to equate 33 and 55. But, it, but the chase is succeeding in the sense that it's showing that Q is empty equal to something false, right? Because if I do apply the chase, I get false. Okay, you want to call it false. That, that's, that's an alternative way to uh, 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 always want to avoid failure. So we don't want to fail. Uh, so instead of saying that it fails, we can say that we have import force. But it's the same thing. And I think in the literature, we'll find the term fail, but I'm, if I'm correct. Uh, okay. Uh, now, if if, if the um, sigma, sigma does not contain EGDs, then it never fails. It only creates new toppers uh, forever. It never fails. Uh, okay, and um, uh, there is this uh, pretty elegant theory that if uh, sigma consists only of TGDs and EGDs, so no existential quantifiers, then the uh, and the chase succeeds, uh, then all that uh, then should, I should have said it better. Then all chases terminate because we know that they terminate from here. Uh, then all chases terminate, and they terminate in the same query, which is denoted uh, chase of Q. Mm -hmm. I didn't phrase this uh, carefully. You'll find it in the book. I wanted to prove it for you. Uh, then I got stuck in the proof. Um, um, uh, yeah, uh, but, but um, the, the, the takeaway is that uh, if, if we don't prove uh, force uh, and um, we don't have existential quantifiers, then uh, the chase terminates at a unique uh, query. Think of that as being the a canonical database for that query. Uh, okay, so this is an important property, the semantic property of the chase. This is why the chase is useful. It is useful uh, because whenever we have a, um, uh, a, um, a generalized dependency and uh, uh, GD, uh, and if we apply one chase, then um, under the the the, the, um, the under this this constraint sigma, we have this inclusion. We actually have equivalence, but the the interesting uh, implication is inclusion. Um, think about it this way: once we chase, we add more constraints to the query. So uh, technically, you expect Q1 to be uh, contained in Q2. But what the theorem says is that uh, actually we also have Q contained in Q1, which means that it will be equivalent. So I had an attempt to uh, to prove it, but I think I'm going to skip it. It's, it's really it's really what what you expect. It's a mouthful. Um, I actually, let's let's quickly highlight the 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 uh, the important uh, ideas. <laughs> the thing is that we need to reason. Uh, about a database that satisfies sigma. Uh, so for these kind of statements, it's easiest to assume that Q is a Boolean query. And to prove that this containment holds, uh, we assume that the query uh, on the left is true. And then we want to show that the, the extended query with additional constraints is also true. That would be the goal. And in addition, we also assume that D satisfies sigma, satisfies this, uh, this generalized dependency. So in particular, since Q of D is true, it means that there exists a homomorphism from the query to the database. Yep, so far no, no need for the constraint, just a homomorphism from the query to the database. Um, but we also have 
given this homomorphism that we used to apply the chase, which is a homomorphism from the left-hand side of the constraint from here into Q. That gives us a homomorphism from uh, A to the database. And we use this to reason about the fact that the database satisfies the constraint. And therefore, the right-hand side of the constraint must also be true. And I think that is a crux of the, of the proof. How do we uh, use it? Well, at this point, we need to uh, consider uh, the, the two cases. Is it a TGD or is it an EGD? And if it's a, it's, it's a TGD, then the consequence is its existential quantifier. The query adds um, uh, theta of B uh, with that variable Y, which is exposed here. Um, and then all we need to, to, to argue is that the, this homomorphism from Q to D can be extended to a homomorphism from, from this image of B in, into D. And that's something that can be done. Okay, I don't want to bore you any, anymore with the, with the proof. Uh, the, the important thing is that you need to use somehow the property that this database satisfies the, your constraint. Good, so this is a semantic property that we need. So um, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's review how we check a query containment. So to check query containment, uh, uh, we start with a simple observation that whenever we have a rewriting from Q to Q1, then Q1 is containing Q2 unconditioned, no need for any constraints. And why is that? Why is Q1 containing Q, Q? Yes? We're only adding uh, conjunctions? Exactly, because we are only adding conjunctions. It's immediate to find a homomorphism from Q to Q1. Just map Q to whatever, whatever it's sitting, Q1. Uh, what the soundness theorem gives us is the opposite containment. That was a hard part. Uh, and therefore, these two are, are, are equivalent. So how do we check containment uh, under, under const constraints? So we want to check if Q is containing Q prime. We chase Q. So we chase Q, which gives us a, a decreasing chain, uh, an unconditioned decreasing chain. And at some point we might be lucky and maybe one of these is actually contained an unconditionally in Q prime. And then we are done. Then uh, the, 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 under the constraint sigma, we have Q con containing Q prime. Okay, any, any questions here? Maybe I, I kind of, uh, it's, it's a very simple slide. <laughs> Maybe I, I spent too much time and um, um, you know, overemphasized it, but it, it really shows that you need to apply the chase and I was trying to be very, very pedantic here about in the, the direction in which this chase helps us. Uh, there is a direction which, where it doesn't help us much, uh, namely uh, this direction. It makes a query. Um, um, uh, you know, it makes it makes a query kind of more constrained and more and more constrained. So it, it shouldn't help us in the in the containment, but it does help because all these uh, even more and more constrained queries they actually they're not to be equivalent to the original query. That is the beauty of the JS. Good. So let's uh, move on to um, uh, to the semantic optimization I promised. Um, just a quick note is to, ch to check equivalence instead of containment. You need to chase both queries and hope that uh, eventually you find two, two, two uh, versions that are equivalent. That's all there is. So let's talk about semantic optimization. And I'm basing this on a beautiful paper, it's actually a line of work, they have more, more papers, um, called Chase and Back Chase. That um, uh, has a very simple message. Let me put it this way. How to use a chase, the chase principle to do semantic uh, query optimization. Um, so remember that uh, if we only have uh, full TGDs and EGDs, then the chase terminates. So we can start from a query and uh, repeatedly chase it until we get a unique canonical query 
uh, where the chase doesn't give us anything new, kind of the canonical database for, for Q. And the idea in this paper is that the semantic optimization can be described by starting in reverse, finding other queries that would chase into your canonical database. Uh, and this is a search process. And if you add to this a cost-based optimizer, then you, you can do fantastic query optimization. Let me show you an example. So here is an example. And this is uh, actually, there is more to this slide than just the example. There is an important message here. Uh, we have a relation R. Uh, K is a key, which is easy for us to describe. But here is the interesting message. We have an index. We have an index on, on, uh, on R. Uh, what is an index? Uh, we'll describe it in a second. Um, but uh, right now, I want to say that if you want to retrieve the Ys associated to 55, this is my query, then you should be able to optimize it to Q prime that does a, a join between uh, the index and R. In what sense is this query more efficient? If you are a pure logician, never saw databases before, you would say this is less efficient. Search R is small. Yes, because there is a hidden assumption here that the API for I is such that given 55, it could quickly give us a key. And there is another API for R that given the key can quickly retrieve the X and Ys. This is, and the, and the query optimizer, of course, will know this. How the cost function is on? Uh, um, this is a, a, a deep story in, in query optimization. Uh, the best way I can describe it is, um, I, I just read somewhere, this is fantastic thing. So query optimization is not rocket science. If you fail at query optimization, they send you to build rockets. So uh, it's not something we can <laughs> uh, describe um, right here. Okay, so I, I, all I want is uh, logically to be able to rewrite this into this. For that, I need to say stuff about the index. Uh, I need to say that uh, k, k is a key in R, which we know how to do. And we say that I is an index by asserting two implications, two, two inclusion dependencies. Uh, everything in R is in the index, and everything in the index appears in R as well. This is an important message. These physical this, um, uh, access um, physical access structures for databases can be described in a logical way. And uh, as far as I know, the first idea was introduced by Ioannidis under the, G, the name GMAPS. Uh, back in mid, mid, the mid, mid 90s. Beautiful, beautiful idea. Once you, kept, uh, once you understand this, any fantastic optimization you can think of, uh, I mean, data structure, you should be able to uh, capture logically um, in, in this way. So now let's see, how do we rewrite, uh, how, how do you prove that Q is equivalent to Q prime using these um, um, generalized dependencies? It should be easy. So um, Q, rewrites to this query by using the functional dependency. Uh, no, not uh, sorry, the first inclusion dependency. Uh, it says that if you're looking for uh, a K55Y, then uh, you are guaranteed that you will also find K55 in the index. Uh, and Q prime uh, uh, chases as follows. Uh, so this is Q prime. Uh, it chases based on the second inclusion. It says that if you're looking for the index, uh, if you're looking up something in the index, then there is some tuple in R that has the same K and 55. That tuple has its own value Y prime. This is my Y from here, but uh, I renamed it because we don't want to clash it with this Y. But of course, we know that these two Ys must be the same because of the function dependency. This is what the next chase does. It simply equates y and y prime, and we get uh, this query, which is equivalent to the chase of q. Now, uh, in practice, of course, we are not given q prime. We are only given q. <clears throat> but the idea behind chase and back chase, which I find so elegant, 
is that you start from Q, you uh, chase it until uh, completion, until saturation, and then you search backwards. So you, you chase Q uh, up to saturation, and then you search backwards, uh, um, the back chase. Um, until you find a query that is um, that has a sufficiently low cost. Now, this backward search, of course, there is a lot of engineering because uh, the, it's not unique. Uh, you you ex explore a wide space, um, but you, you cannot avoid this engineering. What is important is to have the right conceptual framework over, over which you build that engineering. Okay, good. So I'm uh, three minutes uh, over time, but we are also done. Um, so things to take away, all these uh, database constraints, you should always think of them in, uh, as uh, sentences in first order logic. And they're usually in some restricted fragment of first order logic. Um, what theoreticians like to do with constraints, they like to look at the implication problem um, and uh, depending on the type of constraints, this might be decidable, it might be uh, undecidable, and this is uh, what theoreticians like to study. Uh, chase is a beautiful concept. It came out of theory, uh, but it is super, it's a, it's a fundamental technique. Uh, it is used in egg and egg lock, right? This is what egg and egg lock is doing, it's chasing. Uh, and it, it's it's aware of this, but I claim that database systems, often when they do query optimization, they add an index, they add a materialized view, they're doing chase, even if they don't know this. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that is what I, what I wanted to get. Yes, Connor. So you know query optimizers, like database query optimizers that explicitly design around the three? Uh, so I know relational AI, of course, they have lots of theoreticians that uh, are aware of this, Beyond that, I really don't know how um, where they are. Yeah, Joe is skeptical. Okay, but uh, you know we have a new generation coming up and looking at you, um, and uh, my, hopefully this will bring some methodology to um, query optimization that can use some of these ideas. Yes, Remy. Yeah. So yeah, feel feel free to leave if you if you if you are done. Yeah. So mentioned, like uh, ag is really related to the cascade uh, framework of optimization. So through this relation, you can think of cascade as having our own chase, but I don't think I haven't seen like the, the case in that case in terms of the conversion. Mm -hmm. It's probably fair to say one could do this thing, but not only the good Yeah, and uh, so uh, with Remy and um, um, and um, um, uh, Ihong, another student, we actually look and understanding uh, when the chase terminates and uh, you know how to identify or uh, anything. Uh, and I think Remy and Yi Hong, they are much more advanced than me understanding, but it's a very complicated picture. Uh, and one thing that strikes me is that all the theoreticians say that the EGDs don't matter for termination. And we discovered the opposite. We discovered that um, they do matter. And I, in my head, I can't grasp this yet. Yes, Remy. Uh, so I'm kind of going back to the lectures before. So here we have at these and we do parallelization. But before we also have like a uh, uh, different constraints and entropic functions that generate at these. So is there a like an entropy analog for inclusion uh, dependencies for each of these? Yeah, people ask me this, and uh, I, uh, so the, the question is if we can use entropy um, um, entropic inequalities to reason about other constraints beyond uh, multivariate dependencies and functional dependencies. And I don't know, uh, no, to my knowledge, nobody has been able to do this, which would be very interesting. Yes, Joe. It seems like with discrete probability, you can, you can do this in a straightforward fashion, right? Um, could you could get one to be zero here, if it's zero there, kind of. Um, but with continuous probability, it's not meaningful. Right? But what what does even mean for continuous probability? It's because yeah, I don't think it's even continuous probability since the entropy maximizes based on Gaussian stuff, right? What does the Gaussian even mean for a data? Well, I mean, the data is sample from a continuous probability distribution, but you could have talked about the containment in some of the data. So there is an entropy maximization. 
uh, if the database is, it's, it, it's like probabilistic databases that you talk about sound. Very much on that. There are problem rank treatment of the bunch of very optimizations, like switching questions and going up and get that. Uh, algebraic treatment of, of query optimization. Uh, actually, this is how optimizers work. They do not work at the uh, um, calculus level. They use uh, the algebra. And this is, uh, I think we discussed this. This was one of the major innovations that caught edge. The fact that you can take the, the calculus and convert it into the algebra, and the algebra can be optimized. But for the constraints of modeling them, frankly, is that manageable? Uh, it's a good question. So I know in, in SQL, uh, people use only the simple constraints, key constraints, foreign key constraints, and uh, all sorts of constraints on the attributes, like put, it, put a dash in your phone number. Um, beyond that, there is a general assertion, and the general assertion can be any SQL query, but has to be true. Uh, and as you can imagine, it's very expensive to compute or to check at random. Uh, actually, this is a, a super important problem that database systems need to face. If you have a constraint and your database satisfies the constraint, now comes an update. What is the minimum number of checks that you need to do in order to ensure that this update is still, um, uh, after this update, you still satisfy the constraint? It's easy for keys and foreign keys. It's an exercise I, I enjoy doing with the undergraduates. Uh, what you have a general assertion, like, I don't know, the average cost of an iPad should not exceed the average cost of a MacBook. Uh, when you do an update, then you know you have to compute a complicated query to check these averages again. Let's go. There's a complicated story around triggers in SQL also, where um, um, on update, you, you add other queries to the transaction. Um, some, sometimes that can be query rewriting, which would look a lot like the chase, and sometimes I think you can't, depending on your trigger language. And this was, I don't know if this was ever satisfactorily cleaned up. Um, it was a hot topic in the 90s. And, yeah. uh, Jennifer Widom was, uh, and Stefano Cherry, right? There's never yeah. book together. They were book together. Yeah. Yeah. They were called active databases, many of these triggers. And, you run into issues that are completely uh, orthogonal to the logical aspect of databases, like the, the triggers, the order matters, um, yeah, all sorts of issues. Okay, folks, then I'll see you on Thursday. So, Chris, you're still still online. I don't